afternoon. We're the 2017 NSPS competition team from the University of Akron, Ohio. I'm Jake Stair. I'm Michaela Corbett. I'm Jake Olerud. I'm Aubrey Tobin. I'm Zach Hayes. I'm Travis Caldwell. The scope of our project was to perform a mechanical alignment focusing on high precision vertical control. We performed this at the Timken Steel AQT facility. In doing this, we compared the traditional optical mechanical and the modern digital methods. The importance of mechanical alignment is to ensure um, uh, product efficiency and to reduce wear and tear on your equipment because anytime your product is down, you're losing money. Uh, this type of surveying is such a niche in our industry. Uh, just to kind of put this in perspective for some people who might not understand the importance of it, uh, take your washing machine at home. If it's not perfectly level and you put a load of clothes in there, it's going to shake and vibrate and put unneeded, unneeded stress on the internal parts of your washing machine and eventually it's going to break down. Uh, the same thing goes in a steel mill, power plants, paper mills, uh, all that equipment needs to be precisely aligned because uh, it's moving at high speeds and that kind of stress will cause that to break down just like your washing machine but when a steel mill breaks down it's thousands of dollars a minute that you're losing. We worked at the Tim Steel Advanced Quench and Temper Facility. It's a $40 million facility built in Canton, Ohio, made to treat a variety of different types of steel bars and tubes ranging anywhere from 4 inches to 13 inches in diameter, typical used for the oil and gas industry. So this is a basic layout of the facility. Uh, the product would come in here, it gets heated and then quenched. They do testing in this area and then if any additional tempering is needed, it happens in this section. This is the, the cooling bed and then the discharge area, and that is where we performed our survey. Every steel company has its own unique process, and this is kept as a close secret by these companies, and this can pose a great challenge when getting into these facilities to work. We used the contact formed by a faculty member to establish contact with Timpen Steel and R.E. Warner a local survey company who specializes in this type of work. We stayed in contact with both these companies before and after our field work was completed. While performing our field work, safety was always our number one priority. We all had to wear personal protective equipment while inside the facility. Timken provided us with the hard hats and eye ear protection. The hard hats and eye protection had to be worn at all times. However, since the machinery was not running at the time, the ear protection was not necessary. So before entering the facility, we all had to undergo specific safety training requirements. Part of this was contractor training. And this part, portion of our safety training was specific to the steel plant as a whole. This portion was online. We had to study the Timken Steel Safety Manual, take and pass the online exam, and then we received a safety certificate. We then had site-specific safety training. And this portion of our safety training was specific to the AQT facility itself. This included a security check-in, where we presented our driver's license and certificates to a Timken representative, who then gave us a visitor's pass for the day. We then traveled to the AQT facility site, but before entering the facility, we entered a job trailer where we had a safety briefing. This included an orientation video and going over the safety rules. The single greatest danger of this facility was the machinery itself. So to ensure that every person in the facility knew when the machinery was about to be turned on, there is a process known as lockout tagout. The machinery key is placed inside of a lockbox, and everyone is to put their own tag onto this lockbox. If the machinery is to be turned on, every person in the facility is to unlock his or her own tag. As part of our on-site safety training, we also had a plant walkthrough. The lead, the lead engineer gave us a tour of the facility, showing us the equipment, how it works, the hazards of the equipment, as, and specified for us to walk in certain areas. During the duration of our field work, there was a Timken representative present at all times. So due to the safety, security, and secrecy of the specialized equipment and these types of surveys, we were limited to four hours on-site. And an hour and a half of that time was taken up with the site-specific safety training. So we actually only had two and a half hours to collect data for our project. For the traditional method, we used the Pentax AFL-280 auto level with micrometer. And for the modern method, we used the Faro Vantage digital laser tracker with Polywork software. 
We calculated traditional level notes using the auto level and then later record them with the data collected by the tracker. Okay, so your first step in any survey is to establish your control. Um, as you can see in this picture, there's two control points in a concrete pad. That concrete pad is actually three by three by six foot deep. There's two of these inside the footprint of the building, and they are the first thing there before any construction starts. Um, so between these two pads, they're on opposite ends of the facility. Uh, your brass pin there on the bottom is your horizontal control. So this establishes your main baseline for the entire facility. Everything in the facility is based off of this baseline, uh, from the foundation, the concrete pad, to the structural steel, the crane rails that the crane sits on, uh, down to the actual equipment itself. Uh, the, the bolt in the top, or the control point in the top of the slab is a carriage bolt, that is your vertical control. A carriage bolt is a rounded top bolt, so you get the same approximate elevation every time. Okay, so the next thing, next step that you need to do is transfer your control. This is a steel mill. It's a uh, kind of a not. <laughs> it's always moving. Uh, things are always going on. It's likely that your primary control is going to get damaged. So to save that control, it's a good idea to transfer that to other places for safekeeping later down the road. Uh, anchor bolts for vertical control are very popular. They're stable. They're not going to move. They're usually protected by the equipment or. Uh, columns. Uh, for the tracker, there are these things called pucks, which is just another control point, just like your hub and your tack, your iron pin. These can be welded or epoxy around the facility. Uh, they are magnetic, so your tracker target just sits in there like a prism, and then you can resection in with your tracker to get set up. Uh, lastly, uh, you can use equipment as control, which is what we did in our project. Uh, this is exclusive to when you would be aligning new equipment to old equipment. Uh, and to do, you use this as your control because you need to match the product flow of the old equipment to the new equipment. To match this product flow, you use what's called a perfect piece of pipe. Uh, this pipe is four to six feet long. It's machined, uh, milled, and it's stored away in an office or a room somewhere to keep it from being damaged. Uh, so with this pipe, you would lay it in three to four rollers at a time and then you could then observe that pipe with either your auto level, your wild T2, or with the Ferro laser tracker to be able to project that line into the new equipment so you can align. Uh, so this project is based on vertical control, but in a mechanical alignment setting, your X, Y, and Z are all equally as important. So we thought it was worthwhile to mention the horizontal. So the, the first method we'd used was the traditional method using the optical mechanical instruments. This is the Wild T2. Um, this was industry standard up until the trackers were introduced. They began manufacturing this in the 1920s and it's a piece of equipment that's still used today. It has an angular accuracy of one second. Uh, the T2 focuses more on horizontal control, therefore we didn't go into great detail when we were at the plant with this. What we did focus on was the Pentax AFL 280 auto level with micrometer. This has the ability of 28 times zoom and can read steel or white face scales, although we focus just on steel scales. It has an accuracy without the micrometer of uh, one hundredth of an inch and then with the micrometer one thousandth of an inch. When you do place the micrometer on, you do need a counterweight over the eyepiece of the level and that keeps the uh, whole unit stationary. This is an example of a white face scale. These, along with steel scales, come in many different lengths. And the closer you are, the more of an accurate reading you can get from these. And then in our setting, we did need some extra light just to get accurate readings on the steel scales. So there's some basic steps to the optical, to the traditional method. Uh, the first thing you need to do is determine where you're going to take your measurements. So we chose to set our benchmark on the shaft next to the motor coupler, and then before and after each of the shaft couplers, we took all of our subsequent shots. Uh, the reason being for this is that <coughs> if you had to make any adjustments, you would make it at these couplers. The, the, the basic process behind this is you would you take these measurements, you'd calculate the variations, and then you would give those to the millwrights. If they were not within tolerance, the adjustments would be made at those locations, and then you would do these shots again over and over. Uh, so reading the micrometer was actually a, a fairly easy process. Uh, so the, you would look through the micrometer scope and zero it out so that it had no reading. 
and then just like with a filly rod, you look through your level and you record your uh, inch and tenth of an inch instead of foot and tenth of a foot. And then you're going to do a process called miking down. And what you're actually doing is you're rotating the knob on the micrometer and it's actually moving the crosshairs down until you meet the nearest hundredth of an inch on your steel scale. You go back to the micrometer's eyepiece and record its reading and that gives you your thousandth accuracy when you're uh, using the level. Uh, next we did the modern method using the digital laser tracker. We also got the chance to use the more accurate advanced and modern Faro Vintage laser tracker. This along with its accessories and the software that it's run with can cost upwards to $140,000. The reason that companies are purchasing these to be used is because the equipment manufacturers are actually requiring these on job sites when setting equipment. It has the ability to take up to 1,000 shots per minute and has a uh, distance accuracy of 1 hundredth of an inch. Uh, to put that in terms, you actually have to wipe away the grease and the dirt from the areas you are taking measurements because they can affect your accuracy. The Faro can view 360 degrees around, 78 degrees up, and 52 degrees down and achieve an angular accuracy of 1 hundredth of a degree. In relation to a total station, that would be a half second gun. This is the tracker target that's used with the Vantage. And then these are just some of the many accessories you can get to achieve different offsets by attaching it to the target, much like using different rods and prisms. Polyworks and the Faro uh, Vantage Tracker work simultaneously. The user can go in and shoot two points and create uh, an axis, and then actually rotate these axes based on the project. This is just an example of the shaft that we shot in and the uh, axis that we created. Okay, so getting your tracker set up is, a, is kind of a process. There's a calibration process, much like with the total station, where it needs to know its temperature so it can calculate atmospheric pressures, things like that. Uh, the tracker does the same thing, but it's in a 45 minute to an hour long process that it does itself. Uh, the other thing that it calculates in this process is its level. You can set this tracker up anywhere on a stable surface. Uh, stable surface being on a magnet mounted upside down in, on the top of the mill or on the side of the wall on a magnet or a tripod. Um, from there, after its calibration process is complete, you use the, use the pucks that we talked about earlier and put your tracker target on there and you can resection in uh, just like you would with a total station. Uh, we did not do this though, as I said earlier, we used our equipment as the control. So just to zero our gun, we use what we're calling a calibration point. This is the head of a bolt next to the motor coupler on the equipment. Uh, we did do three direct and three reverse to set the gun up. Okay, so as I said, we're using the equipment as the control. So this works all off of lines, basically. So we have to create a center line. So first we observe the shaft at both ends. Uh, you can see on this picture the little white dots that are around the face of the shaft. Uh, this is where the thousand shots per minute come into play. Uh, so basically what you're going to do is you take that tracker target, you're just going to run it across the face of the shaft for as much as you can see. Uh, and the Polyworks software is able to make a model and project that shaft uh, very accurately. We actually tested it and shot two inches of the shaft and then that, that uh, distance and it was still able to project that shaft to within six thousandths of an inch. Um, so after you observe both ends, you want to rotate your axes to whatever whatever you're comfortable with. We rotated our x-axis with the center line of the shaft and the z-axis up in the air uh, relative to the calibration point. Uh, so lastly, we had to get our data to compare to the optical level. So we kept the same benchmark location as the optical level, level uh, took that shot, and then the subsequent shots were at the same locations on the shaft couplers. Polyworks has a multitude of features that you can do with the uh, Vantage. One of them is 3D modeling. So we created a 3D model of the shaft and then from there you can actually go in and analyze each point that you shot from the shaft. You can also plug in your tolerances prior to taking shots. So the system will actually tell you as you're going along the shaft if you're passing or failing based on those tolerances. So after we established the benchmark, each team member took a reading using the model level and recorded it in our field book. As we were doing this, we were being instructed on how to read the steel scale, white face scale, and the micrometer. 
When we were finished with the auto level, then we moved on to the tracker. Each team member took a series of observations while using the tracker target, and another team member was recording this data in the Polywork software. The advantage to using the tracker is that you immediately know a pass or a fail as opposed to calculating it by hand. So after the data was collected by the laser tracker, we then compared it with the field notes collected by the auto level. So we took all of our data and we put it into a spreadsheet so that we could do some basic statistical analysis about them. Uh, the first thing that we noted was that from our benchmark to our first subsequent shot, we had about a quarter inch elevation difference. And you know, we talked about how this equipment's moving at very high speeds and at very high tolerances. We're one or two thousandths of an inch. That's the thickness of a playing card. So how could this quarter inch difference be acceptable? Well, realistically, it's not. Um, <clears throat> In, in this situation, the uh, AQT facility is actually moving the product at a very slow pace, about two feet per minute. Uh, the shaft that we recorded is only making a quarter turn once every 10 minutes. <clears throat> so we did our statistical analysis just with a range, median, and standard deviation. Uh, because the benchmark is the same assumed elevation for both methods, we removed it from our data set. And this tightened up our numbers quite a bit. <coughs> uh, the next thing we noticed was that uh, our standard deviation and our range for the digital tracker were much, much higher than the optical mechanical method. So our theory behind this was that because the digital tracker is recording at a higher accuracy, it's, it's going to 10 thousandths of an inch, four decimal places. Optical mechanical, we're recording to a thousandth of an inch or only three decimal places. So to try to make the data more comparable, we truncated our results for the digital tracker. Uh, no rounding, just chopped off the fourth digit, and then did an analysis and compared the two. Uh, this actually over doubled our range and standard deviation. That led us to the conclusion that although the digital tracker is recording at a higher accuracy, in a single shot method like this, it's actually less precise. I mean, we can't return the same results over and over again. Uh, because the digital tracker records 1,000 shots a minute though, you wouldn't be taking single shots like this. You'd be taking multiple redundant shots, and this would bring your precision on. Here's where the team logged the time spent on the project and during field work. These are the sources and citations for the documents we use for our research and guidelines for our project. All these people have helped us out tremendously throughout our project. <clears throat> With special thanks to Andrew Black, the chief engineer of Tip and Steel and Goss in the facility, and Rich Carpenter, who supplies with the equipment and the knowledge of using it from RU Warner. Like a special thanks to our monetary dona donation donors. Without their generous donations, we wouldn't be here today. And we'd like to open up for questions. scale and the steps are fairly basic but it did take a, a few times uh, looking through that, uh, the level especially and learning the micrometer to, to get the hang of how to use that. Uh, the, the laser tracker is very relatable to a total station and we've all used those so it was a little easier to pick up for us. Mm -hmm. And was the surveyor there with you guys? Yes. yes. How, how much time did you spend in safety training compared to the time surveying? Uh, an hour and a half, in, or yeah, an hour and a half in safety training, and then about two and a half doing the field work. And then the online training prior to, yeah. we had to read the, the manual and then actually take the test online. It was about a 30 page pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand how important that is, evidently, in that experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. If I understood you correctly, you had four decimal points from your tracker that you wanted to compare to the three decimal points. And if I heard you correctly, I think you said you truncated it to three instead of rounding it to three? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Do you think that had anything to do with the uh, increase in the, uh, in the result, in the doubt of the results? That, that's entirely possible. We tried to create as close of a comparison between the two. So that's, that's why we didn't round. Uh, early on in the presentation, you talked about the uh, Wild T2. Uh, that was a, uh, 
wasn't an uh, inverted image T2, not the older style, this was a newer style. Uh, did you actually use that or check through to see how that worked? He, he gave us like a brief overview of what you would, what you would do with the T2, but since it was more time constraints and focused on horizontal, he didn't actually go through physical steps with us. Okay. Have any of you ever used a T2? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. How did you like doing the, that type of work with a machine versus uh, different types of field work that you've done? Uh, I love it. Yeah. Um, I, in, in my basic surveying class, I heard about it and nobody really knew much. You can't find a whole lot online, so when this opportunity came up, I was ecstatic about it. And, uh, but I would, they, they travel a lot, so <laughs> that makes it kind of unreliable of career options for me. Yeah, if, if that travel restraint wasn't there, I would consider leaving my current company. It was also nice to do it and not have the stress of making sure that it's exact that they're setting the equipment up. That was a little nice having a little stress for you because that's a stressful job. Yeah, I would think that's a very stressful yeah. job. Yes. So we, when we were instructed on, on what they would be doing or how that would happen normally, because normally they'd bring that equipment in and you'd take those shots and they had to meet that tolerance. So if your shots don't match that tolerance, then they'd have millwrights come in and, and shim the different pieces up at the different locations. So because those were those locations where the adjustments would be made, that's where we took our shots. company flies this $150,000 uh, piece of equipment around? Yeah, it's all it, it went to Texas. Texas. It's got right its own after case and yeah. backpack and everything. Yeah. It's in Texas right now. According to Rich Carpenter, there are only 12 of these tractors in existence in the United States right now, and two of them are RE Warner. So it's very limited, and only certain people can do this work requiring a lot of travel. Did you have to do this at night when the factory closed down, or did so this this is an oil and gas. They they make steel for oil and gas. And since the price of gas is so low right now, it's not. It, they don't they don't the, the the mill's not even running. It hasn't run yet. So that's that they let us work in that one because it's not running. It's safe and it's it's new. So yeah, it was kind of the, the stars aligning there with yeah. with all of this coming together because this is it, it's a very exclusive thing and. And the, the fact that, that Rich Carpenter was willing to share his secrets with us and Timken was, happened to have a plant that wasn't running that we could get into it was just a, a perfect situation. Yes? Uh, what kind of redundancies did you do with your data to ensure that you were collecting it correctly given the short amount of time that you could have? Well, uh, <laughs> realistically, none because this this was like one setup, so that would have happened. They would have made the adjustments. We would have taken the shots again. You're you're working so close with your scales and on such good zoom with the equipment. As long as your equipment's in good check, you don't need to take multiple redundant shots. Uh, you're, you're you're measuring such a small thing. You're not going to get enough of a variation for that to really come into effect. Want to take one more question? Yep. Yeah. One more. If there's one more question. Thank you. Thank you very much.